May Let I me just hug give you? you a hug. Let me give you a congratulatory hug. But I'll come to you. You stay by that yeah, ledge. Yeah, you stay right there. Very close to that ledge. My name is Nate. My name is Mike. And what the hell was that? Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we've done a lot of these episodes, and I always, I always muster the energy to get a what the hell was that out. And this movie isn't even like the worst one we've ever seen. Yeah. But like, uh, it's somehow not one worth of the it. most exhausting though. It's not worth it. It's just not worth the what the hell was that. I think fewer and fewer movies that we see <laughs> are going to be worth it. Uh, you know, like whatever. What the hell was that? I guess yeah. is my question. Uh, I mean, like, well, it's important to first note that, like, this was the movie we saw upon release mm-hmm. that filled the car with <laughs> conversation so much on the ride back that we were like, man, we got to record this. We recounted the plot to each other, got back to our house, recounted the plot to our housemate, and then another housemate came down and we recounted the plot to them once more. That's just how much this movie got under our skin, and honestly, what it gave us the impetus to actually start this podcast in the first place. So very well said. Yeah. So, um, I the this is our celebration of one year of the podcast. Hooray! Uh, this should be released in August, which is approximately when we started the podcast. <laughs> when did we yeah. start it? Um. Well, I, I don't know when we started recording. August was when we re- uh, released our first episode, anyway, right. of last year. Uh-huh. Uh, and we have not necessarily had the most consistent schedule, but uh, that's okay. Um, but yeah, so th- this movie, as Mike very well said, is the inspiration for this podcast. Uh, so Mike and I, uh, one day, um, we were just chatting, and we decided that we were going to go and hate watch Cruella. And uh, we, we were actually so intent on this that by the time that we had decided to do this, uh, none of the theaters yeah, that were yeah. close to us were actually showing it. So we had to drive uh, what was effectively like an hour. 45 minutes downstate, I think. Yeah, 45 yeah. minutes to an hour downstate where we went and saw this movie. And uh, it was it was a blast, honestly. Not because yeah. it was a good movie, but because uh, seeing bad movies with friends is fun. Yeah. Uh, and again, it... it very much inspired us to just talk and right. talk about what we did not like about that movie. <laughs> uh, and it was shortly after that, where I guess I should say, uh, w- that day, completely separate from, from seeing the movie, we just were talking about uh, how doing a podcast might be fun. And then uh, after we saw the movie, spurred the idea of, why don't we do it about bad movies? And uh, then we went and saw F9, and that's the story as it was. Yeah, it's true, it's true. Um, I guess it should also be noted that um, for Moonfall, that was the first movie that we had seen in which uh, we did not do the podcast immediately after seeing the movie. Uh, Right. And we have a similar situation at hand because we watched Cruella a couple days ago at this point, and we were fully well prepared to then talk about Cruella. Um, However... Our audio interface was not working. True. So we had to postpone our recording for a couple days, mm-hmm. and here we are now, and we did not have the strength to uh, rent that movie again and sit through it a third time right. for this. So bear in mind, uh, we might be a little bit more fuzzy on the details oh, than we typically I don't are. I think we'll be fine. But yeah, we, we did have more or less a practice run <laughs> of doing this. Uh, we got to do more or less a live uh, retelling of at the, the plot at the Italian uh, festival. At the Italian festival with our good pals. Hooray. So, uh, yeah, Cruella. Yes. Yes. Okay, so I actually will start off by saying something that I think might surprise you, Mike. Okay. I when we when we were watching this movie for the second time, I have to say I enjoyed it more than I expected to slash remembered enjoying it. Okay. Um, like ironically or unironically? Unironically, or whatever. Yeah, you know, like because it was like it was yeah. still refreshingly bad, or because no. like there were elements that you just enjoyed more. The second, the I latter. See. Yeah. Uh, so I will say, 
Uh, and I'm, I'm sure we'll go into a lot more detail about these specific thoughts as we go along. But I think that for me, um, there were a lot of things about this movie that I think actually worked pretty well and were fun and entertaining. But the, the two things that, to me, make this movie pretty, like, irredeemably bad is, one, the fact that it is uh, about a character who canonically skins puppies. Uh, yes. And B, just has the most ridiculous, stupid ending. Also, yes. Yeah, so, because cause I, I also will say, because uh, we, we talked about this a little bit at the Italian festival when we were talking about this movie with some friends. Right. And uh, apparently this movie has a lot of similarities with some other like pretty famous and popular movies, which I have never seen. True. So perhaps uh, you know th- those the qualities that it takes from those movies I think are really good, and maybe I just would think those movies are really good, and maybe that's where I'm you know I was like oh these parts were entertaining. Right. But uh, yeah, I, I guess the, the long and short of what I'm getting at here is I think that if this movie was uh, completely separated from the character of Cruella Deville and is just uh, random protagonist of this movie who does sure. not have any basis in anything else right. and had a not stupid ending, I could find myself enjoying this movie a lot more, um, is my thing, personally. I mean, I, I see where you're coming from. I just still think the movie was like... the The character development in this movie was mediocre and dissonant to me. So Mm -hmm. that if if there are certain characters that I enjoy the heck out of simply by merit of the performance, the actors put into it yeah, and not really helped in any way by any material on the page. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. No, I get that. I, I guess. And here's, here's where it comes back to me where I, I think that again, the, the qualities that I, I did enjoy about this movie were probably done a lot better in movies that it was more or less influenced by. Could be. Because I, I think I, more specifically, the parts that I, I did think actually worked pretty well were more or less just like the parts where um, where Estella is more or less like working her way up the ladder in um, the fucking fashion, fashion world. Yeah. I can't remember the name of the lady for the life of the me. The Baroness. Yeah, the Baroness. There you go. Um, yeah, like uh, her, you know, working for the Baroness and then, uh, you know, kind of like one-upping her and having this back and forth. Like, that I, I didn't think was bad per se. Like, no, there, no, were, no, there no, were things no, about no. that that I, I did really like. Right. Uh, but no, I, I totally agree that a lot of the characters are just like so drab and not worth it. Well, Which, I, I, again, I don't think this is like treading new ground. Like, no. again, just from the little bit that I know, a Devil Wears Prada the, the Devil or something Wears like Prada. that. Like, that's With probably... With Meryl Streep. Yeah. yeah, like, that, I haven't seen that film either. I, yeah. Go on. But, yeah, from what I gather, like, that's more or less what it is. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think that it's safe to say that uh, Devil Wears Prada is probably the, the much superior of the two, but... I think that's where the movie shines and where it shines alone. Yeah, I mean, like, I think I feel the same way strictly because, like, whoever the actress is that plays the Baroness, I just think had a really good... Emma Thompson. What? Emma Thompson. Mm -hmm. Emma Thompson did a really good job. And it's not her fault that the character, like, falls off a cliff (laughs) basically around the arson point. Um, You know, like, it's not her fault for that. But, um, like, before that, I just love the Baroness as a character. Like, I think she's just really well done. Yeah, but uh, you know, so that's why I think I like that part. You know, just because it's a lot of Baroness-led stuff that I think works pretty well. Yeah. Though there's there's still some stuff that I'm like, all right, that's hack. You know, like <laughs> that that part there was pretty dumb. I don't know why we need that in there. I know why they do it, but it's all too standard. Like it's it's all too overdone and cliche and stuff for a lot of the stuff. So you know. Yeah. Well, with that, do you think uh, we're ready to get into this plot? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, from what I understand, we start from, like, the funeral, or, like, the death, right? And she's like, oh, um, I'm in a fucking grave. And she's like, let's rewind. And she's like, oh, that's my birth. I guess let's start there. You're absolutely right. I forgot about that. <laughs> I was just ready to hop right into school days. Right. Well, you know, like, it's more or less that. I mean, 
Yeah, basically, like, the, the movie opens, and it's like, how did I wind up dead? And it's like, well, I guess let's start from the beginning. And it does, like, the whole rewind thing. <laughs> and she's being born. And she's like, oh, I guess we're starting that early. And it's like, okay. Oh, too far. And I'm, I'm, al- I'm already done with this movie. Like, not done, but, like, come on. Anyway, so, yeah, th- that. And then it more or less does hop pretty much directly into the school days. It's like, it starts establishing. Uh, and, ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, okay, here's what. I don't like mm-hmm. about the way that big movie franchises try to portray strong female characters. And that is that they are operating on an assumption that the entire world operates in the time when, like, 50s feminism was really necessary, right? And granted, this belies my complete lack of knowledge of, like, legitimate history of feminism but like the narrative so far oh don't mind me mike i'm just sharpening my pitchfork that's good that's good because <laughs> you know i can't pretend like i'm some like avid historian of it but from what i understand the arguments and assumption are that by simply by merit of being like a girl uh who dares to do anything that is not like preparing yourself for marriage <laughs> Or, like, being prim and proper. You are going to be met with, like, the most vile ridicule possible. And in response to that, you are going to show how much of a standout, like, uh, world-class woman and human being you are by, like, being more colorful, exuberant, and aggressive than anybody else in the face of that. And I think that that is all well and good for character fine I, I think that's fine but what it creates in films is a it creates a character that is abrasively seeking out fights on a point that you are writing into your narrative to be hit upon and then their response is to respond with like this very like righteous indignation on behalf of it a righteous indignation that you have written into the film for your character to be uh, almost hunting for and then responding in an aggressive manner as if it makes them a hero and a standout and a visionary. And I think in our current, for me, I am past personally the idea of, of that specific battle for feminism. I think there's, there's much more nuanced things to be handled than just like the you're a girl with colorful hair and we think you're weird and she's like i'll fight you i'm fucking tough even though i'm a girl and that makes me a badass it's it's i'm just like uh oh i don't know it's it's like the tomboy type thing that like it's not it's not groundbreaking and it's not nearly as abrasive and cutting edge as it seems like they really think it's going to play as. And I just hate how they ham it up so much because it makes me kind of not cringe. It makes me cringe, Mm -hmm. I guess is the point. Yeah. um, Because that that is the entirety of her introduction where she's just like, I am woman, hear me war. Is that like the saying? Yeah. Well, that's me, like my colorful hair, and I'm not afraid to like uh, kick over a chair or something like that because I'm just a rebel, baby. Like I'll knock over a trash can because I'm punk rock. And it's a misappropriation of two things that I think I have a healthy respect (laughs) for. So, you know, it's it's, just that being feminism and punk rock. (laughs) (laughs) I figured I just wanted to clarify. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it is an interesting thing. I, I can't say that I'm uh, anybody qualified to say anything about it, really. But uh, no, I will say that I, I, uh, I do think that it is kind of interesting that all like strong female characters uh, have to be like tough in your face kind of people. You know, right. like I, I think there are other ways to to portray uh, very competent, strong female characters who uh, d- defy expectations that are set upon them in a, uh, like, more male-focused world. Uh, yeah, well, look, I just think that there's better explorations to be done into, like, the female psyche and character than, like, 
girl comes into world ready to like put spikes on like jacket and like shout at dudes who look down on her. Mm -hmm. I mean, like I just think that angle's kind of played out, especially when you with the pen get the ability to craft a world that like plays into that, yeah. and your like rebellious hero gets to be like as cool as you want them to be, and you know any adversity they can just like stomp their boot on and be like I'm I'm fucking dope, and yeah. you can just be like all right, whatever, that's fine. And, and, you know, what's what's worse is, like, there's almost, like, it almost feels like the character, every time they do something, like, confident and assertive, is turning at the screen, looking at me, and going, like, and I bet you thought I couldn't do it because I'm a woman. And I'm yeah. going, no, I wasn't thinking that at all. Why are we doing this? <laughs> this is ridiculous. And, you know, it's it's just that type of stuff that, like, gets under my skin about it. And this movie goes into it so hard and it's just weird for me at this point. Like I'm just like, dude, I'm past this. I don't. I. I just don't. I. It doesn't play well with me anymore. Hmm. I. I. I will say maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm wrong here. But like, I don't even know if I necessarily say that the whole movie is so strong on it because like I feel like it's you know this really big thing that's like established in the beginning of like you know her her as a child. She's like. Yeah, I'm awesome and I'm strong and tough. But then I feel like after that, like, I don't know. I don't know that it plays such a big part in it. You know, it, it, it's valid enough that it's like, uh, yeah, yeah. Like later, later in the film, once she like achieves an amount of like social power, I guess, as like Cruella mm -hmm. slash like, uh, it's this is all yeah. This is all just like kind of like the character subtext that gets laid out as she's like in her upbringing as like her mm -hmm. exposition scenes here that like it sets the base for the kind of like internal dialogue that's going on in her mind as she crafts the Cruella character mm -hmm. and like the kind of things that go into it. And I think it comes out in the performance, even if she's not like explicitly saying like, Oh, Hey, remember when I was like a kid and I was talking about like girl power, I still feel that now. Like, you, you know, <laughs> you can still see it kind of I implicit in the way that she portrays the character and I'm sure the character's written and stuff like that yeah. and it's those kind of undertones that make me disconnect from really uh, sympathizing or like connecting with the character I missed other undertones but like that's just one of the base levels that I'm just kind of like alright yeah. I don't know I don't know if this is going to be a character that I'm going to be like this feels real to me yeah. this feels like a real character to me and I like this character and with that, honestly, I feel like that kind of provides more or less all you need to know about this intro is that she goes to school, insert all these uh, these things that the writers yeah, are trying like, to influence well, you she on. She was born with her hair being half black and half white. That's right. Going down yes. the sides, like split down the middle, half white, half black hair. And so she, in addition to being a woman, is an outcast because of that. And so because of that... Uh, uh, then, you know, overly uh, heavy-handed um, uh, girl boss type of things that we see. Yeah, girl boss. That's school. what it is. Yeah. That's, that's, no, what it totally, is. that's yeah. the phrase. It's girl boss stuff. Yeah. That's exactly it. So, yeah, during her time in school, she is very, uh, it's very obvious that she is, in fact, a girl boss. And, uh, yeah, so it's she's, so much of a girl, girl boss, boss in fact, that it keeps causing trouble uh, in school to the point where she gets kicked out of school and like her adult self in the flashbacks to her child keeps referring to herself as like a genius and like a rebel she's like i'm just a fucking trailblazer you know mm -hmm. like this time she's like you just can't hold me down and i'm just yeah. like dude is this supposed to be endearing i don't know and it's important to note now is that the cruella character is there from childhood yeah because before her first day of school her mom like, well, A, like, there's a point where, like, Estella does something and her mom's like, your name's Estella, not Cruella. And I think, like, Estella as a child, like, takes this and creates, like, Cruella to be, like, her, like, bad her, self yeah. alter ego or whatever. Or, yeah, like, her... like anti-Estella. Yeah, and is, like, you know, girl boss. And so, <laughs> like, before school on her first day, mom's like, and what do you do if, like, Cruella, like, starts to come up? And Estella's like, I say thank you for, like, being here, Cruella. I appreciate your suggestion or whatever, but go away now. Mm -hmm. And mom's like, good, now go to school. And so that works for a little bit before it doesn't. And then, mm -hmm. you know, she gets expelled or her mom pulls her out of school yeah, before she can get expelled. But yeah, any, anyway, regardless of, of how much of a girl boss, how much of a genius she may or may not be, 
she's kicked out of school yeah. and her mom is like well fuck like clearly we have to do something to like get you into a school get you a, a good life but like we're kind of broke. So. And and while her adult self during the entire like voiceover and flashback is just like, and that's who I was, and I don't care the consequences because the world can't fucking handle me. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Like she's completely unapologetic about the whole thing, and in fact is like, that's the way to be the child I was. But in the car, there is a single line that I feel like the writers understood. All right, this girl needs to show like. Some, some sympathy towards the yeah. suffering she's causing her mother here. So, like, as her mom's just kind of like, we're poor and moving towns yeah. again. You know, like, there's a line where, like, Child Estella is like, I'm sorry. I'll try to be less abrasive in the new town so that we don't have to move again. And that's, like, the only sign of, like, remorse she will ever show mm-hmm. towards anything she does in this film at all. Mm-mm. At all, no, absolutely, and that's that's it. So, yeah. you know, child Estella being like, "Sorry, Ma, I'll try harder in the next town not to get expelled and make you have to beg for money and make us move towns." Uh, that yeah. was her then, but even her adult in the voiceovers does not care, mm-hmm. and her character moving forward does thinks everything she does in this film is one hundred percent justified and obvious, and yeah. so. And it should be noted that they're not just going to any next town. They're going to London. London. So, yeah, so they're going to London. And the mother, as we have well established, is poor. Uh, is, presumably because of all the moving around that they have to do. Uh, so she's like, oh, okay, Estella, on our way to London, we have to make one quick stop. And Estella's like, okay, fair enough. So they make this one quick stop. And it is at a giant mansion, um, which is called, like, Helman Hel- Hellman, Hall. Hellman. Yeah, Helman Hall. I wouldn't say Hellgate, but I knew that wasn't right. <laughs> Hell's Gate. <laughs> yeah, Helman Hall. So uh, they, they pull up, and there's clearly this, like, extravagant event, like a ball of sorts Masquerade. going on. And uh, so um, the the mother is like, okay, Estella, I need to go and uh, talk to a friend and do something, uh, but you are going to stay in this car, right? Also, at some point, she found a dog. Yeah, there's a dog. Yeah, so she yeah. has a dog. She has a pet dog. Uh, yeah. They're very close. Not at all like the Corella, you know, that wants to like skin them alive. It's not a Dalmatian. Or dead. So, and know. skin them <laughs> and turn them into a coat. No, she loves dogs. She yeah. thinks dogs are the best. Oh, yeah. Uh, this dog gets her. <laughs> her and this dog, they're good friends. They they are. And so uh, she stays in the car. Uh, well, Well, and also her mom's like, oh, and by the way, before I walk out of this car... It takes oh, off a yeah. necklace. That's, that's right. And she's like, hey, this necklace is a family heirloom, and I want you to wear it right now while I go inside. You stay in this car. Remember, like, two miles back when you just said, like, you're going to try harder to not cause us, like, trouble and or do anything that's going to, like, make us move town. So now like, would be, like, me such a great from, time yeah, to practice Yeah, just, like, two that. miles ago when you did yeah. that. Like, just remember that. And here's this necklace as incentive to stay in the car even. Like, just hang on to this necklace. I'll be right back. And Estella is like, yeah, 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 that's good, that's good. Uh, and then not, like, ten seconds go by before she's like, well, I've tried all I can do. Time to go investigate what's going on here. Uh, so she does just that. She gets out of the car, uh, and she's like, I'm going to go see what's going on at this fancy ball. So she, uh, like, hides in a, like, craft table that gets wheeled in. Yep. What she sees inside the, the Hellman Hall place is, is like a fashion show going on, uh, a very extravagant like runway, and we got models going on, and they're showing off their kind of like style theme of the show. It's a very extravagant kind of get together with the centerpiece being like a runway and a fashion show, mm-hmm. and Estella being the uh, the lover of fashion that she is. It's like whoa, this is awesome. This is whoa. so cool. And then uh, her yeah. puppy gets away. So. Uh, yeah, so she then uh, goes to try to get said puppy and gets um, intercepted by Big Bald Man. Yeah. Um, who Who is the... Mark Strong, right? Mark Strong. No, the other guy. No, no, it's definitely Mark no, Strong. No, no, it's no, the other okay. guy. You're, the other you're guy. doing a bit here, <laughs> yeah. and I will have none of it. Um, even though I can't... Stanley Tucci, that's what I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so uh, Stanley Strong uh, ends up uh, intercepting uh, this girl... And uh, I think she has, like, a hat on or something like that that yeah. is hiding her uh, deformed hair. Yeah. Uh, and in one way or another, it gets knocked off or something. 
and he immediately has like a look of like flashback. Mm. He starts flashing back. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm sure this won't come up at all uh, at any point in the film. Uh, so yeah, so then cut to uh, we have um, uh, Cruella's mother or Estella Cruella's mother uh, out on this like balcony terrace kind of thing that overlooks a big cliff. Uh, and then uh, this seemingly um, important affluent lady. And the mother is uh, just like uh, begging this lady. And she's like, listen, I, we just need a little bit of money to like help us get uh, to, to the next town, London. And uh, then you'll, you'll never hear from us again. Uh, and then meanwhile, Estella's causing a racket at yeah. the ball. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. And uh, not only is she causing a racket, but now she's being chased by three Dalmatians. Yeah, who, her uh, puppy yeah. caught the attention of these three Dalmatians, and they're like not happy about they're it. They're the ladies. They're the who we found out to be the Baroness. Mm-hmm. We, they are the Baroness's guard dogs. Like that's that's who they are. And so like she has three Dalmatians as guard dogs, and Estella's little pup has caught their attention. So now Estella and the pup are running away from the three guard dogs. When they find their way out back, where on like the back kind of uh, garden area overlooking the cliff. Uh, Estella hides in some bushes and sees her mother talking to the Baroness. And uh, at at the point that um, Estella h- like hides in these like bushes or whatever, uh, the Dalmatians then lose interest in looking for her and her dog, and instead uh, go right towards the Baroness and uh, Estella's mother. Um, and the Dalmatians then jump up onto Estella's mother, uh, pushing her. Off of the cliff. Yeah, they just to her death. Pretty swiftly, yeah. Yeah. They they push her off the cliff. But they do like kind of like a like a backflip off of her and, and, and <laughs> it make was it pretty back wicked. To, to well, it's safety. pretty wicked. It's like a moonsault type deal. Yeah, like a so, drop so salt. They are they're perfectly fine. So don't worry about the dog. Oh uh, yeah, wait, wait. I just want to make sure I caught this from you. So, Dalmatians killed her mother. Dalmatians did in fact killed Cruella. So like mother. so like three Dalmatians like ran from this house and like just. Killed her mom, huh? Yup, that's that's so right. So, Dalmatians killed her mother. <laughs> that's the plot point? That's the plot point, and that without a doubt means that uh, whatever Cruella de Vil in the future does to Dalmatians, it is entirely justified. Because Dalmatians killed her mother. Exactly. Yes, okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I, I cannot... Well, look, I don't think I can is, put into words yeah. the eye roll that happened. Well, well in the look, because this is a bit, right? Like, literally, it's like a go-to bit amongst our generation. Like, when your villain needs like a type of thing where it's just like, oh, this villain grew up to like hate broccoli or whatever. It's like, <laughs> why? And they're like in their story, they'll be like, broccoli killed my father. <laughs> It'll be like this type of thing. And so, like, on the way to the movie theater, we're like, yeah, we're going to find out what, like, Dalmatians killed her mother or some shit. And lo and behold, like, lo and behold, Mm -hmm. a room full of screenwriters. And they're like, ah, what can we do? What can we do? Not one of them is on the internet. Not a single fucking one of them. When at the board, they get pitched like, well, the Dalmatians could be responsible for her mother's death. <laughs> not one of them was just like, that's a fucking meme. Like, yeah, you don't no, understand? Like, uh, we can't like, do you, that. You don't understand? That's a meme? Like, on the boards for like, oh, we're writing like a Cruella movie and uh, we need a reason for Cruella to hate Dalmatians. Like, the shit posters would all write Dalmatians killed her mother as yeah. a bit. That's what they would do. That's what I was doing, not writing, but like that's that's yeah. for my first bit. I was like, oh, what Dalmatians killed her mom or some well, shit. See, th- this is the thing. I think I think this brings us actually to a point that I think that we glossed over a bit. Um, why was this movie made? <laughs> like, <laughs> who, who? Because Maleficent uh, did very well, I suppose. But yeah, I mean, just like who the fuck thought like you know which character, which Disney character out of all the Disney characters that there are could use a sympathetic backstory. How about the lady who wears dogs like fur that she supposedly well, skins? Well, look, I mean, like, we were kind of doing a bit about this on the car ride back. Like, who else? 
Like we yeah. need we need a human and or humanoid female antagonist <laughs> to be able to like give an actress a role and do like the girl boss thing with. Like your only other options, uh, fine, we mentioned Ursula. <laughs> like yeah. maybe maybe Ursula's next. But like besides that, like what are you going to do? The wicked stepmother from Snow White? <laughs> like what's what's the fucking move here? Honestly, like, I kind of wish that was the case. <laughs> it's <laughs> like we we watch this movie and then we get a whole new perspective and we're like. Wow. Or the queen, the queen from Snow White, or the wicked stepmother from yeah. Cinderella. It's like, like wow, yeah, like, no, exactly. Yeah, is this like, what we do? We, w- I would honestly, I'd love to see a movie where it turns out that like Cinderella is just like, just fucking awful, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah right, that'd yeah, be, that'd totally. Be so, uh, yeah. That'd be or like, or like a remake of that one Cinderella sequel, where it turns it's like from the point of view of like the one of the ugly stepsisters <laughs> yeah. and how she actually has dreams and stuff and like doesn't <laughs> want to be like under her mom's thumb her yeah. whole life and kind of cares about Cinderella but due to social pressures can't like show that mm-hmm. or something you know is that not a better option why why dog skinning lady like what's that all about because she's fabulous I mean she is fabulous but like <laughs> she's fabulous like as the lady in the movie yeah slash like as Glenn Close I guess which, from what I understand, is kind of what they were aiming for, like a character to lead into, like the live-action Glenn Close, 101 Dalmatians, Cruella yeah. Deville. Yeah, I mean, I think I think really one of the big things about it is like, again, th- this this word we kind of like half jokingly are using, but like, girl boss. Yeah. You know, is they they need a girl boss because like, right now, I I think that is like such a a safe thing to do. Uh, to have a successful movie and be able to get like points for being fake progressive, yeah. So in that way, like you say, who else could it be oh, well, like other this, than Cruella? But this is the pro- <sighs> uh, uh, but this is the <laughs> problem with being like fake progressive or mainstream progressive mm-hmm. is that like mainstream progressive is always going to be like 20 years behind like modern actual progressive conversation. That's and fair, so yeah. it's like it's inevitable. That if you're going to try to do something like mainstream progressive, anybody who's actually concerned about, like, progressing the social, what would you say, norms and conversations have had these conversations and, like, three steps further than these conversations and ideas well beyond, like, what we're, what we feel safe going with in a Disney movie. And so, like, I don't know how you don't feel insulted when this is, like, what they peddle out there Mm -hmm. as, like, the art, isn't this great? Isn't this, like, a great embodiment of, like, the exact kind of, like, type of woman one ought to be? And I'm just like, this, no. Well, I mean, it's, it's like, I think one of the things that's also, like, so insulting about it is it's, like, the same thing of, like, uh, I, I've heard it described as like rainbow capitalism, uh, this like thing that happens specifically around Pride Month every year, where all the the corporations change their social media right. profile pictures to like a rainbow version, yeah. and you know all the marketing becomes like, yes, Queen, go and buy a two for five <laughs> yeah, uh, Whopper right, right. at Burger King. Yeah, exactly. Treat yourself. Yeah. Uh, slay. You know? Right. Yes. And it's it's like the equivalent of that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they changed the LEDs out front to be rainbow. Yeah. Yeah. I was talking to someone. <laughs> real quick. I was talking to someone <laughs> in uh, in an old workplace of mine, and they were going to college for, I forget the name of the actual field, uh-huh. but the field is basically like interior design, but for specific displays. Damn it. Like uh-huh. theming stores and like that. Okay. So like if you think like the Lego store is kind of like, a store where the entire inside is designed to be like, oh, this is like... It looks like a big Lego piece. Yeah, exactly. Stuff like that. It's like creating those types of things where a lot of the work comes in like museums and stuff like that. Uh Like the the exhibit kind of building, more or less, right? Like these kind of like interactive things. But like now that idea is starting to get bigger in the actual like commercial department store, retail display type things. And, you know, like, it was just interesting because when we were having this conversation, it was Pride Month and, like, a small little display was set up. And I was like, oh, kind of like that. And they were like, yeah, just like that. But, like, so it's these types of things where it's almost like it's almost like a uh, interactive kind of planning for, like, a monthly theme. But it's that's as deep as it goes. You know, yeah. it's it's a it's a palette rearrangement for the sensibility of the theme of the of the month or whatever. It's not actually any kind of real commitment or desire to push forward like a message it's just riding the curve with whatever the theme is which is a perfect way to describe this movie 
Yeah, 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 a little bit. Well, I mean, specifically when it comes to to the depiction of Cruella Deville as like a progressive female character. Yeah, you know, because here's the thing: like, I don't know. They have to know. There's no way when they were writing this script mm-hmm. and like r- saw the final cut and saw the movie back at them and like read the final manuscript that they were like, "We've created a likable and justified character here." <laughs> That's what we've done. We've made it. There's no way that happened. So I have to think somewhere in them, they thought like, oh, the strength of her character, like, it's flawed, it's messy, it's psychopathic in many ways, but she has like an inevitable charisma and charm about her. I think that's what they thought they were creating, but I don't think the performance and or the character is written with enough nuance and and uh kind of well here's another thing too is skill like, i i feel like one of the obvious like uh comparisons to draw is like the joker sure. you know it's right. like i i feel like with this movie they were trying to make a movie in a sense that was like similar to like Joker, the mm-hmm. Joaquin Phoenix, or one. or the but countless like, other like, you know, like male anti-hero type of like well, yeah, that, flawed that, see, that, but that's charming exactly is, enough and, to be forgiven for it. Well, see that, that that's the thing is that, that that why I specifically bring up the Joker because I think I think actually one of the last things you just said like enough to be forgiven about it because right. with the character of the Joker specifically like you're not supposed to like agree with them yeah. you know it's like uh, with the joker you love them because it, to some extent at least you love to hate them and, mm. and I, th- I think with the joker it is more of a love he's a fun character but that's the thing though is like i i'm, I'm genuinely curious I, I i honestly like was never really super interested in like 101 dalmatians when i was younger sure like is cruella de vil like a character that people love to hate and are like Oh, like, my favorite villain of Disney's catalog is Cruella. Right. Like, I don't know that that's the case. Uh, Well, look, I mean, like, I think the reason a lot of these kind of, like, flawed characters are as liked as they are is because there are people who, in... If they were true to themselves and everything they thought and felt would act in a way that is prevented for them by social consequence... Mm-hmm. So, like, there are things that they want to do or say or feel that they will not do or say because of social consequence. And I think that there's a catharsis and an admiration that comes from people when they see a character act true to themselves with a complete disregard for social consequence. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes when they write these characters, they'll have, because they have the power of the pen, they'll have these characters be, like, rewarded and validated. Mm-hmm. And they'll be like, oh, I act with no fear of social consequence and I'm just true to myself. And the world often gets crafted in a way to validate that and make them seem cooler for doing it, right? So I think that's uh, I think that's one of the many reasons that people like start to like these types of characters. And uh, you know, and it, when it's done well, it's it's not something you voluntarily do. You just like a character yeah. even if they're abrasive. Which is my point, I guess with Cruella, it's like I don't think they've done that very well at all here. And and I think it's because for me the character just doesn't feel true mm-hmm. in any way. Like, so much of it feels like uh, a kind of... There is no point where, like, Cruella or Estella feels real to me. Even in, like, the moments where they're supposed to, quote, like, get real, like, drop the facade and be like, oh, this is me talking to you about how I feel. Like, it just feels so fake and phoned in. Uh, It's just... It's awful. (laughs) It's absolutely (laughs) terrible. And so, like, it's... That's why I don't think this character is charismatic or charming in that way at all. Mm-hmm. You know, no, I think the, clo- uh, yeah. the closest we get for me is when she's like Estelle working her way up in the fashion thing. Like that's when she feels the most real to me. And again, that feels like it's it it should be at least part of a different movie, and it's right. actually, in my opinion, the best part of the movie. And and after Cruella becomes a character, even after like Estelle starts speaking mm-hmm. again, like it doesn't feel like the same Estelle. It seems like. Uh, it seems like the character gets mutated as soon as Cru- Cruella becomes invented, 
And any time, like, Cruella's persona gets dropped, it's like an Estelle that isn't the Estelle we knew. And it doesn't feel true to the character that is supposed to exist under the character of Cruella. And so it's it's a bit strange in that regard. Mm-hmm. So, uh, her mother dies. Yeah, her mother gets murdered by Dalmatians. Murdered uh, by Dalmatians? Murdered by Dalmatians. Yeah, there you yeah. go. And so then, uh, with that, she still uh, is going to go to London. Uh, and now she is, in fact, an orphan. Yes. And she blames herself for her mom's death, by the way. She yeah. she thinks she ch- brought the dogs to yeah, chase her. Yeah, the dogs her. were chasing her and then lost interest in her to go after the mother. Yeah. So, therefore, she killed her yeah, mom. Yeah, if she just stayed in the car, her mom would still be alive is her kind of idea. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, now she's in London. And she's a poor little orphan, and she happens to meet two other poor little orphan boys, mm-hmm. uh, and their dog as well. Well, well, Horace is taking coins okay, from the go, yeah. fountain. Yeah, so it's exactly, yeah. So Horace, uh, which actually I, I guess we should stay as well. Um, I, I can't, I, I've never, I honestly don't even know if I've ever actually seen 101 Dalmatians, but from what I gather... Horace and what's the other guy's name? Jasper. Jasper. Yeah, they're they're characters that we go to see later in in that 101 Dalmatians, and they're more or less the lackeys of Cruella. Right? Yeah. So these two orphan boys are in fact those same characters. Yes. And here they are stealing change from the the fountain where people have uh, spent their hard on hard earned money on wishes. Right. Uh, and a police officer says, "Hey." You can't steal those wishes from those people. Uh, so then he starts chasing the three of them, right. uh, and they they um, do a they make a daring escape into an old abandoned uh, warehouse or something yeah. where they are living their lives. Yes, and that's that. And then ten years go by. Yeah, so they're like Charles they're, Dickens yeah. orphans here. You know, they're yeah. like Oliver Twist orphans, where they like pick a pocket or two mm-hmm. and uh, run around town doing all kinds of scandal. And so we kind of get, like, a flash forward where it's, like, they've been doing that, and now they're all older, and they're, like, proper young adults, like, you know, 20, 21-ish. And Estella has maybe, dyed maybe like her hair red. Even. Maybe, like, 24, 25, maybe. I don't know how old they're supposed to be. Seems like, yeah. seems like you know, like, mid-20s to me. Yeah, something like that. Anyway. I mean, how old's Emma Stone? That's the, we can just say that. Well, yeah. she's probably in her 30s. Right? Yeah, that is true. Like, the switcheroo for the time lapse is yeah. uh, the Cruella dyeing her hair. Yeah. Or Estella dyeing her hair to be, like, an auburn red. Yeah, so she no longer has her uh, her signature uh, black and white hairdo. And Estella is growing discontented with uh, just surviving by robbing off the streets. Like, they live in their uh, artist loft, and they steal money successfully enough to feed themselves. But she's... She still dreams of being a fashion designer. Yeah, yeah. She wants more out of life and wants to create clothes and do fashion stuff. It, she notes that, like, she helps create disguises and stuff for them while yeah. they, like, do, like, their jobs. So, like, Jasper and Horace do a lot of, like, the handiwork. And she helps. Yeah. And uh, then we get a good montage of them uh, doing, doing a bunch of uh, of their their heists. Steelies and pickpocketies mm-hmm. and stuff. Yeah. And then um, immediately after said montage... They're then um, sitting back in their artist loft in this abandoned building. And uh, then Jasper is like, oh, hey, Estella, by the way, uh, I got you an entry-level job at this department store um, that uh, supposedly does fashion stuff. And uh, it's it's an entry-level job, so, you know, you can work your way up. But, yeah, you don't have to, like, steal with us anymore. We want you to... Live your dreams. And Horace is like, we do. And Jasper's like, we do. Uh, and yeah, so. Happy birthday. And, yeah, uh, yeah, I think it is her birthday. Yeah. Exactly. And Horace is like, so when are we going to rob the joint? And yeah. Jasper's like, we're not doing that. It's not that type of thing. And Horace is like, it's always that type of thing, baby. Yeah, he's just like, okay, wink, wink. Yeah, right. So Estelle starts at the fashion store. And she's so excited. Yeah. Uh, but it turns out that entry level position uh, means. Scrubbing the floors. Yeah, she's uh, yeah, she scrubs the floors and cleans the toilets and all that. Yeah, and the whole thing is so undignified and very funny. And um, mm-hmm. and all the while, uh, any chance that she gets, she's trying to convince her boss, like, hey, seriously, I'm a like, uh, I could be an asset to to you. Like, I am very good at fashion. If you would just give me a chance. 
And uh, more or less every time he's like, no, fuck off. Go clean something. Yeah, the manager's like, you clean floors. Go clean floors. Yeah. <laughs> and he's very hoity-toity and uptight, this manager. Yeah. Uh, so it's that. Is this a kid's movie? Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Some of the expressions and characters that get played seem perfect for children's media. And then at the same time, I feel like if it is a kid's movie... They really should have taken more care with the Cruella character. Mm -hmm. Anyway. In what regard? What? Just not being such a fucking psycho. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know? <laughs> you know? I guess it's not the impression you want to give to children as far as heroes and media go. Not like any movie that exists is really probably the impression you want to give to children for heroes and media, but like a lot of them aren't intended to be children's films. So I don't know what Cruella is meant to be. Yeah. Anyway. But, uh, yeah, so uh, she, you know, day after day is just kind of getting, like, um, shafted as, like, she's trying to, to pursue her dream. Um, yeah. And it kind of comes to, like, a breaking point. So she uh, goes Gets to take out, out the trash, and, it, like Mike said, she uh, a, a bag more or less explodes on her. Yeah. She's covered in trash. <laughs> and then she has a moment of, like, huh, this job isn't what I thought it would be. And uh, Horace is like, so are we robbing the place? She's like, no. Uh, and then she tries to go back in the back, but has found that she locked herself out. So her only option is to walk through the storefront covered in trash. So she does that. And her boss is like, huh, I'm hoity-toity, and, and you are not res um, uh, uh, representing my establishment the way that I would like. Uh, you now, uh, instead of getting fired because I'm a nice guy, uh, you're going to have to clean my office overnight. Yeah. And, yeah, so she does that to keep her job. And as she does that, she finds, like, liquor that he keeps in his office, and she's like, fuck it, I'm just going to drink this. Mm -hmm. So she does, gets really drunk, blacks out, and wakes up the next morning uh, basically having redecorated the front window display with her own uh, vision of what it ought to be and her own message in, like, a drunken blackout. Mm -hmm. So she wakes up in the front window display with her work, and her kind of, like, rebellious, uh, very, what would you say, counter-cultural uh, counter, counter -cultural kind of yeah, aesthetic like to it. You I'd know, like, there's, there's like, graffiti-type stuff scribbled on the wall. Yeah. And kind of like, oh, this is what a fashion ought to look like. And, like, oh, uh, do you like this look or whatever the fuck. And uh, Horace and Jasper are, like, outside the window as she wakes up. And they're like, hey, we're here. Are we going to rob this place? Uh, to which... Our, uh, then we have the, the door to the window display um, opens up and we see her boss who then sees this window display and it's like, oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah, right. uh, so he puts on his uh, best smiley face and is like, come over here, please. Yeah, right. uh, to where as soon as he's, uh, she's out of sight of the, uh, the, the public is like, what the absolute fuck? Uh, I'm going to fire you and also probably press charges because... Uh, the Baroness, who is very important in fashion, uh, is on her way, and you absolutely have screwed me. Yes, and she's here. Yeah, uh, and so and and while um, this this uh, reprimanding is happening, Jasper and Horace have entered the store, yeah. and they are uh, b more or less robbing um, her boss and the store at large. Yeah, right. Um, and so uh, then she gets away and starts hiding. Um, as the Baroness comes in. And so then this dude uh, is trying his best to save face. Uh, he's like, oh, I'm so sorry, ma'am. Uh, don't worry. Uh, this is being taken care of. Uh, to which the Baroness is like, well, every um, window design you've done lately sucks ass. And this one's actually good for once. Right. So um, who did it? And he's like, uh, I don't understand. You yeah. like it? Uh, and she's like, yeah. Uh, Find me the person who did it. Uh, to which Estella is like, I did it. Um, and uh, meanwhile, she is like actively being like handcuffed by the police. Yeah. Um, and uh, then she gets a business card from uh, the Baroness's assistant. Uh -huh. And uh, he's like, okay, be there at 5 a.m. tomorrow. Bye. And right. then they escape the police and the department store. Uh, they being Estella and uh, her crew. Yeah. Yeah. So that's good. So it's the next day. Estella gets to go to work now mm -hmm. at the Baroness's place. And, man, it looks like it's 
uh, a, a very tough, uh, very stressful workplace. Yeah, like her first thing is just like the Baroness shows up and reads a review from her recent fashion show. And they're like, man, the Baroness is so cool and she's so good at fashion. So good. The best. And the Baroness is like, all right, that's great. Anyway, we got a new show coming up. So everyone make me a dress or some shit. And so, you know, Estella's kind of standing there like a deer in the headlights. And, like, an assistant comes up and is like, grab some fabric. Make her dress. Yeah, let's and do it. And so that's what uh, she does. And, uh, you know, this is basically where it starts, where, like, she throws something together. And the Baroness comes up and, like, Goes is, like, down looking the at the rest of yeah. the workers. She's like, terrible. You're fired. Insulting. Awful. And, like, stops Kill at Kill yourself. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly, yes. And then stops at Estella's. Kind of, like, turns her head a little bit. Like, cuts some pieces off of it. And it's like, now Not it's bad. perfect. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. So it's, it's like that type of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, and yeah. Meanwhile, the Baroness is, like, uh, is very much, like, uh, I, I did this. Yeah, of like, me making it perfect was more or less doing all of the, the work that is yeah, valuable. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think more or less it's it's just uh, more or less several instances of, of that type of thing as Estella kind of moves her way up on this this ladder here. And she's as she is kind of making her way up, she is uh, – Becoming more respected by uh, yeah, she's like getting her, her lunch and stuff, and continuing yeah. to make good dresses. And Baroness is continuing to be impressed, mm-hmm. and says that she might be something, and and reminds her of herself at a young age. Yeah, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And so, like, there's this part, and this is again where like the writing loses me a little bit, because like there's this part where like it's Roger, for what that's worth, and another lawyer. That are like representing something or someone. Maybe it's not Roger. Anyway, it's two like <laughs> lawyers, and they're here to like ask the Baroness something uncomfortable. And the Baroness is like, "Oh, you won't like give me money or whatever. Maybe I'll just take some money from your offshore bank account under like the account number blankety 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 blank." And I'm just thinking, "Well, now what the hell? Like, okay, I get it." The idea is that you want to show the Baroness is, like, playing chess while everyone else is playing checkers. Like, I get Mm -hmm. it. That's good. That's a fine character trait for her to have. But, like, the way you write this into the film is to have her, like, somehow have procured the offshore bank account numbers of this fucking, like, board member from some fucking place. It just seems so out of left field. It, yeah. And it, for me, it really threw me for a loop because I was like, oh, come on now. Like, sh- you could have come up with something. Now, granted, like, I'm not going to sit around and try to think yeah. of, like, something. But, like, that is so out of place and unnecessary for her to somehow have access to yeah. be able to, like, what, call a PI? Who the fuck does she call? <laughs> Central Bank? Like, just be like, oh, give me the account numbers of this fucking guy I want to get one over on. Yeah. Like, what? What? Well, to be fair, uh, it left such little impression on me that I hardly even know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, well, so. it, yeah, I forgot about it, too. And then the second time I saw it, it just stood out more to me. And I was like, oh, fuck, right. But, yeah, so um, I, I think really the, the important thing that happens uh, is that she has a necklace on. <laughs> well, yeah, okay, because Estella walks in during this meeting, yeah. right, and uh, walks up to her, and she's like, I'm going to take, like, a power nap or some shit, and, like, leans over. And she's wearing the necklace that Estella's mom gave to her that uh, she lost when the Dalmatians killed her mother. Yeah. And, um, yeah, she, like, left it behind yeah. in all the kerfuffle. And uh, Estella uh, pretty much I, – I don't remember exactly what she says, but more or less just one degree less from, like, hey, that's my mom's. Uh, but she's like, huh, that's b- beautiful. Uh, tell me more about it. Right. To which uh, the Baroness is like, oh, yes, some employee of mine stole it many years ago, and I recovered it. Yep. Uh, to which Estella... Uh, yeah, no, she says no, she didn't. And then the Baroness is like, huh? Uh, and oh, she's yeah, like, uh-huh, uh-huh. I remember. Sorry. Yeah. Major, like, vocal delivery problem there. I mean, no, she didn't. Yeah. yeah so like, I, yeah. Okay, now I remember. That's because that's... That's why I remember doing the bit yeah. of, like, like that I, I wish that, that she line. did say, she did blurt out, like, no, that was my mother. She yeah. stole it. And yeah. then had to, like, no, that was my 
<laughs> mother's uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> trying to, to no, work that was it my out. mother's she gave it to me yeah i, I mean i mean <laughs> no that was my mother's yeah. she gave it to me <laughs> 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 no i love your yeah. necklace um, <laughs> but yeah so anyway um uh then because i guess uh to, we we should we should make it clear that though we have been referring to her as the, the baroness throughout the entirety of this plot recap right. Uh, it is not until yeah, this moment that is, it is explicitly um, explicitly made clear that the woman who was talking to Estella's mother was the Baroness. Right. Um, and so now Estella has made this connection, and um, I, I guess Cruella, the character, the, the, the personality that is Cruella, who, is, who has essentially been uh, living dormant since the death of her mother is now uh, brought back to life. So she's like, oh, the Baroness has my necklace. I want my necklace back. It's time to plan a heist. Yeah, and good thing they have a, a crew and a proficiency for heists. So, uh, yeah, so so now they, they plan a very elaborate heist, uh, and they then execute a pretty elaborate heist. Uh, well, yes, and furthermore... Yeah, please. In, in the planning for the heist, Estella is like, all right, we need a pretty – it's the black and white ball. Everyone will be wearing black and white. Strict rules, black and white only. Um, the goal is to dress nicely but not so nice that you'll upstage the Baroness because you'll get booted from the party. Mm -hmm. uh, don't be old. You'll get booted from the party. Yeah. Don't be rambunctious. You'll get booted from the party. And so Estella is like, this is the perfect time for us to actually intentionally create a distraction and a diversion that would usually get you kicked out of the party. But it needs to be a character so larger than life that she won't get kicked out of the party, that she'll firmly stand her ground, and she'll be able to get up close and personal with the Baroness. And Estella says, I know exactly the person to come out of long dormancy inside my own psyche <laughs> <laughs> to arrive at this party. Yeah. Cruella. Ah. Thank God my hair was black and white the whole time. Yeah. For I the black and white party. And so uh, Estella, mm -hmm. either now or some point in the past while looking for stuff for the Baroness, doing fashion things, finds a little like secondhand clothing store on the corner and walks into it and meets a character who's very extravagant kind of like david bowie-esque yeah and his name is arty because mm -hmm. he makes art she meets arty arty's pretty cool i like the character of arty yeah he's fine i i'm a big fan doesn't get a know. lot of screen time true but you know makes the most of it when they're there they're just very uh, exuberant and performative which i'm a sucker for so hell yeah Anyway, although he also does, uh, he he hits uh, Disney's quota of being the like tenth, like first quote unquote first uh, openly yeah, gay character. Yeah, whatever. Look, if you're not tonguing another dude on screen, doesn't <laughs> count for me. Like we won't know progress until we get like full French tonsil hockey on screen between two dudes. Well, honestly, though, that is like, <laughs> I feel like that is kind of the thing that like is kind of so offensive about like. Uh, well, one of the many things that's so offensive about Disney constantly being like, oh, first gay character, is right. that, of course, you know, it is always just, like, characters that a little bit are, like, a bit flamboyant. Yeah. Like, you know, and it's like... Yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't think Artie at any point in this film is like, oh, I'm gay, no, absolutely. by the way, or, like, is, like, dating a man or anything like that. Maybe it might be... Maybe they mentioned something about a boyfriend or a husband or something. I don't shit. think so. But, like... The reason that we assume <coughs> Artie is gay and the reason articles can be written about Artie's gayness is because they just make a caricature of a gay person That's and it, put yeah, it on screen. Exactly. So they make the most cartoonishly gay person they can envision and make sure that they come off as super competent and really cool. And then that way it can be seen as positive gay representation yeah. Which, no, again, I don't know. Seems, if I were to think about it for a bit, I'd say, I don't know, that that feels great for me. Yeah. But I like Artie, so maybe if I was gay and I was seeking representation, I could do worse than Artie. Mm -hmm. Even though Artie is never like, I'm gay, by the way. Mm -hmm. They're just very uh, 
yeah, they're they're very effeminate, one mm. might say, yeah. in the way they kind of carry themselves. And so the assumption is that they're gay, which is profiling and, you know. And is not okay. Which I, you know, I mean, like, it is what it is. No, no judgment claim on it. But uh, I like their character a lot. I don't know. Maybe it's a win. Artie's cool. I like Artie. And it's important to note that in Artie's window display, he has a dress made by the Baroness in like 1962 or some shit. Oh, yeah. And Estella's like, huh. It's a flamboyant red, very, uh, you know, very, it is It is fire engine red. Maybe not that. It's whatever elegant red is, but it's very red. And so Estelle kind of like notes that and is like, right oh. And then also as they're building up to the heist, like Horace is playing with like flash paper and stuff Mm -hmm. because that'll be relevant anyway. So it's heist time. Baroness uh, hates having attention drawn from her. So Estella slash Cruella for her entrance has decided that uh, the, the Baroness like silences everyone is about to start talking and like making like a toast or what have you. And so Cruella uh, approaches what is like a pyramid of champagne glasses, like, one on top of each other, and grabs, like, straight from the middle one Mm. of the champagne glasses as the whole tower topples over and makes a terrible clamor and shatters, and alcohol surrounds Corella at the base of her feet and dress, and she just casually sips it, and the Baroness is kind of like, what in the sweet fuck do you think you're doing? Yeah. And so Corella has now drawn attention to herself, and she has, like, the masquerade mask on, and she has her dress on, and she's sipping... And she's kind of like, hello, and then, like, lights a match and throws it at her feet in the alcohol. And her black and white dress goes up in flames, which I guess was made out of the flash paper that Horace was playing with, revealing the very bright red, very against, like, dress Mm -hmm. code, like, thing. So she's, like, phoenix red in the middle of this, like... Sea of black and white. Yeah, exactly. And the Baroness is like... Oh, what the sweet hell. Security. And so security tries to get Cruella, but she knows cane foo. Oh, yeah. And so she starts, like, slapping the guards with her cane and shit. Yeah. And they can't apprehend her. And she's kind of, like, warding them off with her cane and, like, gives them good smacks on, like, the knees and about the head and stuff like that. Uh-huh. And so they just can't do anything. They can't apprehend Cruella at all. She's got this fucking cane. And so she starts doing that. And eventually the Baroness is like, oh, I give up. I want to talk to you, lady. Yeah. Uh, to which she does, and uh, and I think it's it's at this point where, uh, again, the the heist uh, behind the scenes has been going pretty much along uh, the lines of the plan uh, until it doesn't, and uh, then they kind of have to start improvising a bit, but um, they do that because I think what the intention was, as as we've stated, that uh, Cruella would cause this distraction. And then Horace and Jasper would then be able to do their their thing uh, and get the uh, necklace from the vault. Yeah. However, they get to the vault to find out that the necklace isn't there. And then they're surrounded by guards. But again, they improvise their way out of that. And then Cruella, while talking to the Baroness, finds that the necklace is right on the neck of the Baroness. Which, you know, also breaks the fucking dress code of this <laughs> fucking party. It is it is a necklace that is gold and in the center is a bright red jewel. Yeah. So what the fuck is that all about, Baroness? Is that just you being like coy at your own party? I don't even know if it matches all that well with the... I mean, I'm sure whoever worked on this film would know better than I do what clashes and what doesn't. Yeah. But like, Jesus Christ... Come on, Baroness. What the fuck is that? You don't have, like, a really extravagant, like, black and white silver even fucking, like, necklace thing to wear? But, uh, yeah, so that, um, this, this whole thing kind of concludes with then Horace and Jasper, again, uh, improvising their, their way out of, uh, captivity of these guards, which more or less causes a huge ruckus, uh, in the party. Basically what happens here is Estella grabs the necklace successfully, drops the necklace, And Estella's dog picks up the necklace and starts making off with it. The Baroness notices that Estella's dog has the necklace and is absconding with it. And so she blows a dog whistle that she has on her person. And when she blows the dog whistle, her three guard Dalmatians all start to pursue and chase Estella's dog. And it is at this moment that Estella, seeing the Baroness blow the dog whistle puts it all together in her mind in the flashback when she saw the Baroness pointing at her mother 
with the dog whistle, blowing it, and it's here that she realizes that the Baroness is responsible for her mother's death. Not her, not even really the Dalmatians, I suppose, Mm -hmm. but the Baroness who summoned the Dalmatians on her mother with this dog whistle. The very same dog whistle she's using to direct her Dalmatians towards Estella's dog who's making away with the necklace right now. Exactly. Yep. Revelations left and right. (laughs) Um, And yeah, but uh, they they get out. I don't know what else we can say aside. Well, they get out, but the necklace does not. Okay. Uh, The dog loses uh, hold of the necklace. Someone grabs the necklace. It gets up in the air, and one of the Dalmatians accidentally swallows the necklace. Oh yeah. They eat the necklace in the pursuit, so they don't get away with the necklace. One of the Dalmatians has swallowed it. It is in their stomach now. But they do get away from the party without being arrested or apprehended. That is correct. Yeah, and they make their escape. Um, And then when they make it back home, I think this is when um, the the Estella Cruella persona kind of starts to really, like, uh, show where the the disconnect is. Yeah, there's, like, Estella is not going to be a part of this film anymore, nor the character that was Estella. Are they going to be at all recognizable at yeah. this point onwards? Yeah, at, at this point, anytime Estella is, is, is seen, she is more or less a mask that Cruella is wearing to just tone down the Cruella-ness slightly enough to yeah. not be detected by the Baroness, essentially. And anytime she does drop the Cruella persona, it's still not like Estella as much as it's like some ambiguous new character between the two. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, she gets home and she more or less is like, hey, you two fucks, you bumbling idiots, uh, go get the those dogs from the Baroness. You're going to kidnap them. Yeah, she comes back and she's like, Chorus and Jasper, they have my fucking necklace and you're going to fucking get it. And they're yeah. like, I mean, like, maybe say please, maybe. And she's like, then don't fucking get it. I don't care, you fucking yeah. imbeciles. And they're like, okay. Guess yeah. we'll allow five more of those before we stand <laughs> up for ourselves. <laughs> yeah, like, what the pretty fuck is much. This? Yeah. yeah, they're like, all right, well. Because, you know... Because they're like, that was weird. But they're like, like that yeah. was strange. She's had a hard day, I guess. You know, just found out the Baroness killed her mom and all that. Like, that's rough. And yeah. so, like, you know, like, uh, they're like, all right, we'll get the dogs. And she's like, all right. Yeah. Good. So she um, then continues to work as Estella for the Baroness. But at this point, like, she's had her, like, epiphany moment. Yeah. Where she's like, my new goal, since the Baroness killed my mom... Is no longer just to get the necklace back. I'm going to destroy the Baroness's empire. Yeah, that's what I'm, I'm going to humiliate do. her. Like Cruella is going to usurp the Baroness, and she will have nothing, and I will have everything. So I'm, <laughs> I am going to continue to work for the Baroness, but really strictly only to be inside, so I can help tear down her entire industry. Yep, exactly. And so now we essentially uh, get like just. Um, jumps back and forth between Estella diligently working for the Baroness and then Cruella then upstaging the Baroness at whatever event the Baroness is uh, attending. And it's all all the, of Cruella's um, uh, upstaging are very extravagant and over the top. Yeah, and I like them. Oh, no, they're cool. Yeah. They're, I again probably one of the, the, the like few the one parts where of the she movie. spray paints a masquerade uh, mask on her and it has like the future written <laughs> on it. That would get an audible groan from me. Like, I was just like, oh, oh no. Yeah. Uh, truly, the only one that, that really I was like, oh come on, is the 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 musical number. That's that's the only one that I was really like. Yeah, it's fair. I don't know the future mask. Fucking yeah. ow, ow. Yeah, I did like the one where like. They like ratchet strapped the Baroness's car closed, mm-hmm. and then like she like gets on top of yeah, it. Yeah, and like the, drapes her kind of like train or whatever the fuck you yeah. call it like over the window, and it's just like the Baroness's like face like just visible between it, but uh-huh. like she's covering the entire car and is on top. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, I think that was a cool thing. Oh, really? A lot of the imagery in it is pretty nice. Like yeah, I mean, this the, is the, again like the fashion's kind of cool, you know. Yeah, this is a part of the film that I like enjoyed the visual of, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Again, the future mask, though, it <laughs> kind of shows the undertone of it that just makes you kind of like, oh, God, no. Yeah. God, help me. But, uh, yeah, so uh, basically uh, guerrilla fashion warfare going on. 
And um, <laughs> what I love is like it shows like newspaper clippings <laughs> during yeah, this know. part. <laughs> and it shows newspaper clippings, and it's like a uh, warrant for arrest wanted for Cruella. And there's another one. It's like police have no leads. Ah, uh, if only we knew where she would strike next. <laughs> yeah, like no idea where she'll come next though. And it's like okay, we're getting a montage, a montage of every Baroness event being more or less like bombed and invaded by Cruella with some kind of fashion thing. And you're telling me the police have no leads? <laughs> they have no idea where she might strike next? Yeah. How about we check the Baroness's calendar? <laughs> seems to me like that might provide us yeah, no, with some like insight on where she might strike next. The, the easy solution is just like, at least just keep, like, one police officer, like, <laughs> with the like, Baroness, yeah, like, at whoever her. Whoever the beat cop is that yeah. day, just send him on down. Yeah, no, Ridiculous. Uh, Ridiculous. At some point, I think, I, I guess after most of the guerrilla warfare goes on, or perhaps before, I don't remember, it doesn't really matter either way, I don't think, to the plot here, but Horace and Jasper do end up kidnapping the Dalmatians, and they more or less are just waiting for one of the three Dalmatians to pass the necklace and uh, then recover the necklace. To which, in which uh, case, I imagine they would then return the dogs. But uh, until then, they they're holding on to them. Yeah. And it is. It should be said that this this whole thing. Uh, the, all of the guerrilla warfare fashion things, but especially caring for the Dalmatians has been very hard on Jasper and Horace. And uh, they are really starting to feel underappreciated in this whole uh, whole debacle. And Cruella loves to pile on the lack of appreciation to them. Anytime they're like, hey, we feel kind of underappreciated, she's just kind of like, well, yeah, the fact that you're appreciated at all should be enough for you because, yeah. frankly, I don't appreciate you at all. So there's the fucking door if you don't feel appreciated. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're like, seriously, though, what are we supposed to do with these fucking dogs? Like, we don't have space for them. They're tearing up the furniture. And this is when Cruella makes her first, like, well, maybe they'll make an excellent coat. And they're like, wow, huh? And she's like, <laughs> joking. joking, I'm joking. And they're like, are you joking? She's like, yes. I'm joking. Now get back to work, you fucks. Anyway. All the while, Estella is uh, making quite the impression on the Baroness. And uh, also, I could be wrong about this, but it kind of seems like the Baroness is, like, maybe beginning to put two and two together that uh, Estella is maybe not entirely who she says she is. I, I don't think yet. All the same, they're getting close enough. And Estella, I think, is maybe letting a little bit... Too much of Cruella shine through in her interactions. Yeah, with, she's starting uh, to get a bit the Baroness. more. Yeah, she's starting to get a bit more full of herself with the Baroness. Yeah, um, and so the Baroness uh, then uh, more or less, uh, I guess, commissions um, Estella to make this very grand dress. She basically she gives some exposition where she's like. The spring collection is the most important statement of fashion every year, and it is upon us. This Corella figure has been fucking with all our shit, so our spring collection better be on point. I have nothing, so I need all of you to build some stuff together. So people are working on it, and they have um, pretty much all the dresses they need. But she needs a centerpiece. And Estella slash Corella have figured out a very like intricate kind of way to get her uh, piece to be the centerpiece. By way of uh, showing the Baroness some drawings she's done. The Baroness goes through them all and says none of these are special enough to be the centerpiece. Uh, but that's all part of Estella's plan. So Estella, on her lunch break, kind of goes out and intentionally sits down in front of a camera that the Baroness watches. And, like, pretends to secretively scribble a dress up. And then the Baroness sees her and is like, oh, go grab that. So <laughs> they go grab that. And Estella's like, oh, what the fuck? And the Baroness is like, oh, you're still withholding things from me. <laughs> and Estella's like, what? I can't, like, work on stuff in my own time? And the Baroness is like, I own everything you work on in your own time and uh, your soul. Like, read your contract. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, basically the dress is this extravagant kind of, like, green and gold beaded dress. And the Baroness is like, this, it will be my centerpiece. So get working on it. And Estella's like, I need to have the beads imported, but yeah, we'll do it. 
So yeah, so the beads get imported. She makes the dress, um, and yeah, and so uh, I think either uh, during the the cre- the creating process of this dress, or once the dress is finished, uh, Cruella then uh, devises a plan to have Horace and Jasper break into the uh, place of work uh, and make sure that the guard is well aware that a break-in happened, causing the Baroness to get paranoid enough to put all of the dresses inside of a vault. And and when they're doing the break-in, this is when Horace and Jasper have their kind of like, I don't like the way Krill is treating us right now. Uh, but they yeah, do it anyway. Blah, 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 blah. We gotta have a talk with her about how she's been treating us recently. Anyway. But first, let's finish this job. Yeah, so they do that, and yeah, so the Baroness puts all the dresses in the vault. Yeah, it all goes according to plan. And it's time for the show! Whoa. Yeah, so uh, the the show happens, and um, I'm trying to think if anything really, like, of note happens outside of the vault during this this time. Like, anything really going on? They jam the lock. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the... the Basically, they they fuck it up so that it'll it'll be harder to get the vault open. And this is when the Baroness kind of like makes her play that she thinks Estella and Cruella might be working together and or the very same, because she tells bald man Mark Strong, like, hey, when Estella gets in here, take her aside. And bald man Mark Strong is like, I think that your judgment that Estella is Cruella or is working with her is uh is not accurate. And the Baroness is like, I don't pay you to think, or whatever she actually says. And uh, she's like, just do it when she gets here. But she never gets there. <gasps> yeah. So uh, all that happens. And then meanwhile, inside of the vault, uh, it turns out that those gold beads are not, in fact, gold beads, but, in fact, cocoons in which moths are uh, are living in. Yep. Uh, and so these moths, confined to the vault, then hatch out of their eggs and then destroy every single one of the dresses. Yep. Uh, and then finally the Baroness, Baroness gets, it open, or gets the vault open. All of the moths do, in fact, get out, and she sees that her entire collection has been... Or not entire collection. Her, her collection for this event has been destroyed, and uh, I, I think at this moment she realizes that Estella is, in fact, Cruella. Well, she's just certain now. You yeah. Know? yeah. It's so clear with this dress sabotage and all that. Anyway, a thing that stuck with me is that there is a biblical amount of moths coming out oh, of this yeah. vault no, when certainly. they open it up. Like, enough to, like, cover the sky type shit. Like, it is, it is insane. I don't know how many beads were on that dress or how many moths come out per cocoon. But it seems like way more. But that's just that's a nitpicky. Uh, whatever. I can appreciate uh, artistic license with these things. A lot of malls. A lot of malls. Anyway, point being, as the malls fly out and the show gets kind of dismissed because there's no show to see here anymore, you hear in the background the faint sound of rock guitar. Oh yeah, this is where that happens. Yes. Oh, God. Yeah, th- this honestly was probably, like, the part where I cringed the hardest. Um, but, yeah, there essentially is a, like, pop-up uh, fashion show runway kind of dealio while um, Artie plays guitar. Um, no, I think Jasper plays guitar. Oh, you're right, you're right. Jasper Artie does sings, I'm pretty sure. Absolutely, you're 100% right. And they play uh, the Stooges, is it? Now I want to be your dog. dog. Uh, the most absolutely on-the-nose thing yeah. you could possibly do. Uh, and, yeah, they do that, and everybody loves it. Cruella's the coolest. Well, and importantly, Cruella's dress has a Dalmatian pattern on it, and the Baroness sees it, and she goes, She skinned my dogs to make a coat. Yeah, because we she still has not received her dogs back. Yes, so she's like she jumps to the conclusion that Cruella has skinned her dogs to make a coat. It's my head cannon that she did, and the dogs that are in uh, Jasper and uh, Horace's cares are are uh, like in in the same vein that your fish dies and your mom gets you a new one without you uh, noticing. I like to think one of them was pregnant. <laughs> yeah, and we don't see any puppies. That's true. That's Cruella. That's, she yeah. wanted 101 Dalmatian puppies. <laughs> so I think she might just be like a puppy thing with her. Yeah. Jasper and Horace get seen by the Baroness. 
And the Baroness, like, puts together Jasper and Horace as, like, lackeys of Cruella's slash uh-huh. Estella's. So the Baroness and, like, her whatever hitmen mm-hmm. security guard team or whatever the fuck follow them back to the artist lofts. And so when Cruella gets up the elevator, she sees Horace and Jasper there being kind of, like, held hostage. Uh-huh. And uh, she she makes a note about, like, you know, let them go, even though they're fucking idiots for being tracked back here. Like, you, they let you follow the fucking imbeciles, uh-huh. but let them go or whatever. And so, like, the, she lets them go, and uh, Cruella comes in, and this is when the Baroness, in, like, a total character shift for me. <laughs> I mean, like, she was ruthless in, like, a fashion sense. And I guess it's implied she'd use Dalmatians to kill her mom. So maybe it's not a complete character shift. Just weird. It's just a weird tonal yeah, shift in the film yeah. for me, I guess. Where it's, like, it's no longer, like, fashion warfare. Or like, oh, I'll get that, that fashionista yet. Yeah. This is where she's like, all right, I'm going to burn your house down with you inside. Yeah, no, I'm going to literally kill you. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, so she does just that. She uh, lights the place ablaze. Yep. So Jasper and Horace are, are being framed for her murder. Uh, and so, yeah, so uh, they're being more or less sent off to the police um, to take the rap for this while uh, Cruella is supposed to burn in this fire. And the fire has started, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's looking pretty bleak. Uh, but it's, it's looking – it's, in fact, looking bleak enough that, um, that the Baroness is like, cool, my work here is done. I assume you'll die here. Goodbye. Um, and then as Cruella is fading away into that, uh, that good night, uh, we see Mark Strong, uh, save her. <laughs> yep. Yep. And yeah. So then she wakes up in, uh, like Mark Strong's apartment mm-hmm. and, and this is also probably one of the most egregious exposition dumps Dude, the rest me. of the movie from the fire on out is just like, what? Yeah. Like what? The fuck? Yeah, so so then Mark Strong is like, "Hey, how's it going? Um I I knew it was you or something like that. Uh here's the deal. Um the Baroness is in fact your mother. Uh but as you can tell, the Baroness is a ruthless uh heartless person. So when she was pregnant, though your father was like super stoked about it, uh she wasn't. So uh when you were born, she uh basically told me to to kill you or dispose of you. Uh, and so I, I couldn't have, or I didn't have the heart to kill you because uh, I'm not a baby murderer. Uh, oh. So instead, I uh, gave you to the lady who raised you, who was a former employee of your mother's, who was actually the Baroness. Uh, and uh, your father died of heartbreak or something. Uh, and it made the Baroness even worse or something. Uh, but yeah, you're the rightful heir to the Baroness's fortune. Um, yeah, so then she is like, okay, I know what I have to do. So then she more or less uh, then like takes a garbage truck and like busts through the police um, building and then gets Horace and Jasper out, uh, to which then Horace and Jasper are like, uh, thanks for getting us out, but also fuck you. You've treated us like absolute dog shit. Yeah. Uh, and then... <laughs> and then, then she goes, well, there's something I really need to say after all that's happened. The Baroness is my mother. Dude. 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 No. <laughs> I mean, yes. But what fucking got me was like, if I'm writing this movie, right, and you have this moment where the character is like, has been just a total dick to their innocent friends this whole time. And like, this is the moment where the friends are like, Hey, you've been a total dick to us. And the moment where the character's owning up to their dickishness. If you wanted to write a pretty straightforward and not super original, but it will get you there kind of line, you might write, there's no easy way to say this, all right? I'm sorry, okay? Look, I know what I did was wrong. I know I've been acting really terribly to you. I'm sorry. I promise I lost myself in the, the situation I was in. I lost sight of my friends. I lost sight of who I was. I'm sorry. And so when she's teeing this up, she's like, please just get in the car. Get she's in the like car. She's like going down like all like the checklist leading up to the sorry. that moment. The moment where you say, I'm sorry. I've been really terrible. And so 
she's like, come on, just get in the car. And they're like, no, you've been treating us like garbage. You don't want to get in the car. And she goes, all right, there's no easy way to say this. And I'm thinking, all right, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It might not be enough. It might still be pretty weak, but she's going to say, I'm sorry. And she goes, there's no easy way to say this. The Baroness is my mother. And I'm just like, what the fuck? Self-involved to the point past death. And honestly, I think what what makes this especially worse is like, honestly, I feel like it could honestly even be in character to have that happen. Where, again, it's this, this very like, this lead up where you are very much expecting the words to come out of her mouth to be... I'm sorry, but you know, it's not. Instead, it's it's this self-involved bullshit because at the end of the day, she is still you know, she's still like evil Cruella, you know. Uh and yeah, I feel yeah, like really what she said is like I hear what you're saying, things are really hard for me right now. Well, here's the thing though, is again, I I feel like and they've just got harder. I it's it's not that that's the problem. Isn't that that's out of character or anything? Right, because it could be. It could the, very much be in character. I think what what's terrible about it is that Jasper and Horace, Horace are, are like, like, oh, that oh, explains we get it. everything. Oh, it's totally cool. No, yeah. like I I feel yeah. like that. Honestly, yeah. If, if exactly, if she did exactly what she did, right, and it was then followed by Horace and Jasper being like, hey, the what fuck? the fuck? Yeah, we don't care. We don't even get a sorry. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. Like, and and then you know then she could have the the sorry that's half hearted and you know brings the gang back together. Right. But yeah, like I, I feel like that at least would have it would have been in character and it would have also just kind of like been better than just doing like a sappy yeah. kind of sorry. But no, they just yeah yeah Horace and Jasper are just like oh okay let's go yeah. take down the Baroness. Right, and I think that's what like infuriates me about it is that like the screenwriters by doing this by making that work, seem to imply that that is enough. Like, she's just been terrible to them, and then just goes, things just got even harder for me. And they're like, oh, we get it all, we're your friends again. Like, what the fuck? Not even a slight acknowledgement, just like, oh my god, I've just completely dehumanized you, my two good friends who took me in off the streets, and I've treated you like lackeys and like garbage for the past, like, three months. Mm. Not even a bit of that. Yeah. Not even a bit. Just like, oh, me, oh, my life, oh, me. And they're like, oh, we stopped thinking about you and your troubles for a little bit, and they only got worse. Oh, how terrible. Yeah. Like, what the fuck is that? Um, yeah, so then they go back to Mark Strong's apartment where uh, they're more or less like, all right, here's the plan. And then uh, it's like, all right, cool, everybody got that? Awesome. All right, cool. Um, uh, Jasper, meet me on the terrace so we can have a heart-to-heart -heart kind of. And, yeah, then, then they go out on the terrace. But, yeah, he's like, you're not going to kill the Baroness, are you? And she's like, oh, I might. And he's like, no, seriously, though, mm -hmm. you're not going to kill the Baroness, are you? And she's like, no, <laughs> we won't do that, all right? Unless we have to. Yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and then, meanwhile, um, Horace is, like, down on the street, and he's like, oh, this car is called a devil. And then uh, what's his name is like, uh, or Jasper is like, no, it's a devil or something like that. And then she's like, huh, that has a nice ring to it. Whatever. Uh, also, I guess this also might be a good point uh, as we go into the final like um, plan being unfurled here. Uh, it might be worth noting that there is like, this one, um, like, extremely irrelevant character that we didn't mention who's, like, a reporter or something. Anita. Anita, yeah. Uh, yeah. She, Anita and Roger are the people who own the Pongo and Perdita, the uh, two Dalmatians okay. Again, and 101 I, I didn't, Dalmatians. I honestly don't even think I've ever seen 101 Dalmatians. It's a good movie. So, you should yeah. check it out. It's a good movie. Uh, but, yeah, I, she she's there and occasionally says something, and that's about the extent of her character yeah. involvement in this yeah. story. Yes. Um, Same with Roger. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, so, anyway, they... Um, uh, I don't know, man. All right, so <laughs> here's the plan. Um, they get a bunch of black and white wigs in the style of Cruella's hair, and they send them with forged letters of notice to all the people who are going to be attending the Baroness's party that night that as a tribute to Cruella, they are all to wear these wigs. So 
they all start uh, going to the manor to get their party on. Uh, the Baroness, meanwhile, is like, oh shit, I don't think a body was recovered. I'm pretty sure Cruella's still alive. And uh, the whole security team is like, all right, keep an eye out for any sign of Cruella. If you see her at all, like, tackle her and bring her to the Baroness or get off the premises or whatever. So, unbeknownst to the Baroness, as all the guests start arriving in their Cruella wigs, like, security's tackling them all, and they're all like, what did I say? And so, uh, you know, the Baroness is like, oh, what the fuck's going on here? Mm-hmm. And security's like, they all look like Cruella. Huh. So they abandon that uh, attempt because all the guests look like Cruella. So Cruella gets to slip in unnoticed. And meanwhile, uh, Horace and Jasper have like, or, or, yeah, Horace and Jasper have also made their way in and have, are dressed like guards and have like stolen the comms of uh, one of the guards yeah. or something. And like Artie's there too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, worth. Artie's there, too. That's right. For what it's worth. And, uh, and they're like, oh, uh, every single guard, uh, you need to go into this room. The Baroness is very upset and needs to talk to all of you. And they're like, oh, okay. And so then they all go into this room where Horace then locks them in. Yeah. So the Baroness sees uh, all the Corella people and thinking on the fly is like, oh, I'm so glad you all decided to do this tribute to our good friend Corella. Here's to Corella. And what the wonderful adversary she was in the fashion world. It's a damn shame she's dead. Uh, Here, here. And basically, through a bunch of, like, Ocean's Eleven type shit, uh, Cruella basically finds a way to get the dog whistle off of the Baroness. Mm -hmm. Uh, Go to the back where she killed her mother. Mm -hmm. The Baroness killed Estella's mother, that is. Yes. Uh, Blows the dog whistle. Mm-hmm. Gets the Dalmatian. Wait, I'm sorry. I, I might have missed this. Did did you did you mention how she changed into her uh, Stella clothes? Oh, fucking a. Because th- this is important here. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah. So so she so uh, everything does happen exactly as Mike says. But somewhere in the inner room, she changes from her Cruella Deville uh, persona back into Estella. And so now. As Estella, and uh, may I very well make a uh, fine point to say, not Cruella. Yeah, she's Estella. She stands at this balcony where her her adoptive mother uh, was killed, and all these circumstances have been set. Yeah, so she blows the dog whistle. Uh, and all of... Um, the guard dogs. Well, yeah, and, and uh, I, you might have said this already, but I missed. Uh, and all... Basically, uh, while the, all this has been going down, uh, already and um and um anita and uh uh, uh 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 horace and jasper have all been like oh hey everybody at the party you should go check out what's on the terrace no, the not, not really quite yet but yeah wants yeah, you to see what's this. going on there yeah so like that they're telling all the guests to go out back uh estella is blowing the dog whistle and the guard dogs are leading the baroness oh, to God, I fucking estella forgot about this. the baroness is holding the guard dogs and so like they're like tugging on the chains so the Baroness, like, gets out back and unleashes them, and then they all run towards Estella because they hear the dog whistle, and then they all, like, heal by her side uh, in solidarity. So the Baroness and Estella are hashing it out while all the, uh, you know, Artie, Horace, Jasper, Anita, all them are telling all the guests, like, go to the backyard. The Baroness wants to see you there. So the Baroness and Estella are talking, and uh, the Baroness is basically doing this bit where she's like, Oh, my lovely daughter, how far you've come. What a great plan you concocted. You survived murder. This is great. I think I'm finally ready to take you under my wing and accept you as my own. You've impressed me to no end. And so she's like, May Let I just hug give you? you a hug. Let me give you a congratulatory hug. But I'll come to you. You stay by that yeah, ledge. Yeah, you stay right there, very close to that ledge. And Estella uh, says, You're not going to push me off this cliff, are you? And... Uh, uh, the, the Baroness is laughing as she starts to go in for the hug. And, no, of course not. Yeah, and more or less, like, after the hug is done, just goes like, yeah, more or less, and, like, shoves Estella off the cliff Whoa! in full view and witness of all the party guests. Mm-hmm. Uh, to which she turns around and immediately notices all of the party guests and uh, tries to backpedal like, uh, she, she jumped. That crazy woman tried to drag me to my death with her. That's crazy. She jumped. Which, of course, nobody's buying. You saw she, her jump. Like, no, come on. We all saw her jump. Right? Come on. Come on. Uh, yeah, and uh, then uh, she gets wheeled away by the police um, where she loses everything. And then um, we are, are then shown a funeral stone. 
which uh, has or funeral stone. That's not the word. A, 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 a tombstone. Headstone. That's the right. Yeah. yeah. A headstone. Whichever. Uh, yeah. Fuck it. And upon it reads Estella last name. <laughs> I don't remember the name. Fucking um, a. And uh, yeah, and <laughs> God. Uh, Go on. I don't want to, man. Oh, okay, okay, it's fine. All right, so <laughs> so all right, we'll do this together. Estella is now narrating, and she's like, "And that was the death of me. What an unfortunate way to die." Except, and then we zoom back to when Estella <laughs> is being shoved off the cliff. So she's falling, mm. falling, falling to her death. And around, like, the fourth rotation as she's falling to her death, she regains her kind of, like, a posture in air mm -hmm. enough to pull her secret parachute. And she <laughs> fucking ripcords it, and <laughs> boom, out comes this parachute. And she, like, voiceover, she's like, Estella comes prepared, or whatever the fuck. I forget yeah. what the fuck <laughs> she's saying, but it's nonsense. As she rips her fucking parachute that she hid in her dress or some shit. It's more or less just like, you can't outboss a girl boss. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so she lands in the water and like flares down a boat that she had waiting in the waters to come pick her up or some shit. Mm -hmm. And then it flashes back to how Estella, before she came to the party, signed all of her possessions in her will over to Cruella de Vil, and now Estella, as she uh, does her parachute and goes down, she now transforms back into Cruella. And, and Estella is now legally dead. Yeah, Estella is presumed dead. Her body never to be recovered from the jaws of the ocean. And so uh, she now reappears to the front of the manor as Cruella, making her grand entrance as the Baroness gets carted off. And the Baroness might as well be in a straitjacket as she goes <laughs> like, it's the same person, don't yeah. you see? <laughs> don't you see? It's the same person. And they're all like, whatever, lady, get in the car, murderer. And so Cruella makes her like grand entrance, and they explain how Estella, being the only child of the Baroness, and the Baroness now going to jail forever, loses all of her belongings to Estella. But Estella, who is now presumed dead, left all of her belongings in her well to Cruella, who is now here in front of the manor gate. And now Cruella has the mansion, hooray, and pries off the man in Hellman Hall to make it Hell Hall, which is relevant for 101 Dalmatians reasons. But now uh, Cruella has the mansion, and I guess lives in a happy fucking mansion home with her dog and the three Dalmatians and her crew. Don't know what happens there, but yeah. that's what happens uh, to set this all up. So who fucking knows? You know what I think would be, like, phenomenal? That's yeah. the end of the movie, by the way. That is the end um, of the movie, yes. How, like, awesome would it be if um, it turns out the Baroness was not the person who pushed the mother off the cliff? And, uh, in fact, the mother, when fell falling off the cliff, had a parachute, parachute? and then yeah. took the identity of the Baroness? Baroness. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly, yes. That would perfect. be awesome. <laughs> that would be perfect. Yeah, no, like, everybody who comes in possession of this mansion has, like, <laughs> just left their, their uh, have, has faked their own death. Yeah. And then left uh, all of their possessions to themselves. Yeah, right, right. No, yeah. I love that. That's great. Yeah. I like that idea. I'm running with it. <laughs> yeah, but uh, that's that's the movie that uh, that started it all for us. Dude, that, that ending is just such fucking whiplash, dude. Like, it's insane. Yeah. It's an insane, it, it all... And, you know, the thing is, like, you don't even see it, like, come together. Like, it is literally just, like, an outro. In the same way that the intro was just, like, a montage of, like, school scenes being, like, I'm the girl bossiest. Yeah. Like, the outro is just, like, a mishmash of, like, expository scenes being, like, oh, I did this. Oh, and I did that in the background, and I did this. And now Cruella owns the mansion. Ha ha. Ho ho. Yeah, I just, I just really don't think I can, like properly put into words how absolutely shocked I was when the parachute was pulled. You know? Yeah. And to be fair, you push her off the cliff. I don't know what they could have done to, like, not do that. Right. But that being said, I can't believe they did that. Um, I, I, I feel like even, you know, like, as we are watching the film for the first time in the theater, like, 
similar to like the the oh the Dalmatians killed her mother. Yeah. Like I feel like it had to be like the oh I bet you she has a parachute. Yeah, and right. the fact that she did, it's yeah. just like I. <laughs> I just I can't I can't put into words how much it fucking shocked me. My jaw actually hit the floor. I know I said something. If I had to react to it all over again now, I probably would just think like, "Oh sweet Christ!" <laughs> like they fucking did it. They did the parachute. Like what the hell, man? Ay ay ay. Seriously, how does like a, a room full? Of- there has to have been a point. And I have to suspect it's like the Fashion Devil Wears Prada point, where all the screenwriters were really into the project, and then like maybe like nine months passed, and they were like, <laughs> we gotta get this thing on the fucking floor. Like, what are we supposed to do? We don't know how she was brought into this earth or how she gets control of the mansion. Yeah. What in God's Christ's name are we gonna do here? And that's just what they came up with. Yeah. I feel like they had like dice. <laughs> like narrative cliche dice, they just rolled them and were like, all right, so her, their mother's murdered by the Dalmatians, and she has a parachute to survive the cliff. Yeah, um, I don't know. This movie was really something. I, I think you know. I was saying to you like before. It was like I, I this movie like, I, I you know it's funny because you know in a way it left such an impression on us to the the, the fact that it inspired us to then actually do the podcast and yeah. and we were talking about this movie nonstop for a pretty long time after seeing it. But on the other hand, it is kind of funny how uninspired or how uninspiring it is to me because i i remember when we were when we were watching this the second time i was just like i was totally expecting scenes from another movie like i i was expecting i i kept intersplicing scenes from um last night in soho right because right. like uh, e- even the parts that I like, which again are like the parts that were focused on, like the fashion and like the the fashion warfare that goes on. Right. Even that is like so kind of like unoriginal and uninspired that like there are so many other movies that do it just as well or better that like it just you know take your pick of them. Yeah. Um. Yeah. No. This. I don't know. I'm just exhausted by how like. How the movie does stuff that makes me cringe and does it with pride. And I'm just like, yeah. what is this? Yeah, they really, like, girl boss their way to the end. Yeah. And, like, look, you had a point in the beginning about how, like... No, no. <laughs> the girl boss presides. The feminist bend to it doesn't throughout the whole film. Mm-hmm. But, uh... Or, or should yeah, I say no. the kind of shallow hack... Feminist bend to it. Yeah, uh, it doesn't preside throughout the film, but it is very girl bossy throughout the entire film. No, that's very true. And um, well, because girl boss is almost more of an attitude than anything else. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. (laughs) (laughs) No, you're right. It's kind of like a Karen or something like that. Yeah. Like it's it's just one of those. It's a caricature of a human being that is just incredibly unpleasant to be around. Uh, and they, and they make their hero that person as if that's supposed to help. I, I just don't get it. There's a lot of one star reviews for this film that I dislike because uh, inevitably it gets to some point where they just start hating on like wokeness and I'm just like, that's not, I don't give a fuck about that. Yeah, no. But I I mean, mean, we touched on the fact that, well, honestly, I think the problem is, is like, I, I, I can say that I dislike this for quote unquote wokeness but i think the way i use wokeness and the way the people in these reviews are very different because i see wokeness as uh kind of actually i don't know i actually because this is actually i think kind of similar to how i think some people in these reviews might say but okay let let me just get my thoughts out here and then i can kind of clarify as we go along I I agree that the the quote unquote wokeness is annoying in the sense of uh, again as we kind of already established like this like fake progressiveness like just kind of doing these things that um, are seen to be progressive just for the sake of like trying to capitalize on like the fact that these things are being talked about and accepted more in mainstream society and uh, kind of get brownie points for doing the absolute bare minimum. Right. Uh, I, I think 
I think that the difference between what I would say is woke and what these people would say is woke is what I see as woke is, again, them doing the absolute bare minimum and uh, in a very phony and fraudulent way, whereas I think a lot of these people see it as uh, shoehorning in uh, uh, left-wing propaganda, which I don't think they're doing. Where me and the people who criticize you for being woke <clears throat> agree is in this. The reason the people who criticize you for being, quote, woke are upset about it uh -huh. is because they don't like <laughs> either, if, let it be uh, gay people, mm -hmm. trans people, women, mm -hmm. people who are darker of skin, whatever it may be, whatever fucking reason they want. Yeah. You know, like, they don't like seeing those characters on their screen made hyper-competent. Where I, you even exist. What? Or even exist. Well, yeah, exactly. Like, they don't like seeing them exist, and they think any part of them being uh, existing is an aggrievance to their sensibilities. And then every degree of hyper-competence that they're given mm -hmm. infuriates them even more. And why I get infuriated by this is because the way they do this is they one-dimensionalize these representations of certain classes of people... Mm -hmm. And then have them break a paradigm, a regressive paradigm, that they enforce or create to make it seem like they are building a strong character. So, for the sake of Artie, right? They create Artie to be a very flamboyant, kind of effeminate, uh, power, honey, cartoony, gay kind of person who loves fashion and loves getting up to, like, mischief. Uh, so... Inevitably, they have built this one-dimensional character of Artie, of being this kind of gay person, and enforcing that paradigm of it. So, they in turn felt the need to break the paradigm that they have created and reinforced here by putting a scene in the film where Artie is able to handle themselves in, like, hand-to-hand -hand combat, and they, mm -hmm. like, karate chop yeah. a fucking security guard. So, it's these types of things where it's like, they make the characters through their writing one-dimensionalized, and then the way that they seek to break that dimension is just by doing something that is the complete opposite of the character that they've created here. Mm -hmm. So they've reduced and made a poorly made character and think the thing that's going to make that character cooler is by doing something just completely opposite as to what you might expect the caricature of that person to do which is all they've written, which yeah. doesn't make a good character at all. It just makes these kind of like, what would you say? Like, uh, you know, hyper competent, like, oh, they're the perfect uh, representation of this exact specific kind of character, but they also do all the other stuff they wouldn't expect this character to do. Yeah. And it's a bit ridiculous. And so the reason the people who hate woke stuff get mad about it is because they don't want to see gay characters, period, yeah. let alone gay characters doing kung fu. And so, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. and so I, you know, you can sense their anger and their seething towards, like, the fact that there's a gay person who seems cool on their screen at all. Yeah. I don't like it because it it robs these communities of having any realistically written characters or stories about them in the media and constantly reduces yeah, it's just them. Yeah, it sucks. It just sucks. And then it's hack, which makes it suck even more. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, God damn it, I don't want to see it. Uh, yeah, no, I think that's that's all uh, pretty on point. Um, do you want to read some reviews, or how do you want to go about this? Um, I'm good on reading reviews. Read your okay. two reviews. Yeah, I, I do have two reviews. So uh, I, I read one of these aloud to you uh, the other day. I don't think I read the second one. Yes. So I'll, I'll read that one first, because this is the five-star review. Um. So this is a five-star review, which actually I will say also this this movie was rated a lot higher than I expected. Um, so I don't know what that says about me and Mike. Uh, but hey, people, uh, <laughs> people who are willing to go write a review seem to like this film, as far as Google is concerned. That's true. Yes. Uh, but anyway, this is from a user by the name of Ashen Cook, and it reads. Jesus Christ! Not only does this film reach our expectations as a film, 
it surpasses them. This movie has an amazing screenplay. The story structure is strong. There was a vision, and it was executed perfectly amongst the cast and crew. I don't even know where to begin with the actors. Phenomenal job by all of them, especially Emma Stone. Emma truly brought the story to life. The way she essentially was playing two different roles in the same film as Stella and Cruella truly ended up leaving me in awe. The music fit the story for every different emotion being felt within each scene. The cinematography was visually gorgeous and easy on the eyes. No crazy camera movements that made me want to throw up, lol. Anyway, I give it a 9.5 out of 10. Definitely recommend. Great movie to watch with the fam as well. Which, one thing I will say to, uh, to their review here is, uh, I, I will say, I don't think that, like, Emma Stone did a bad job acting. Actually, I'll, I'll go one step further. I don't really think that anybody acted poorly in the movie. It's more so yeah, that no. it was written just god-awfully. Yeah, no, the actors were all perfectly competent, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that's my take on that. Yeah, they do good. In some, in some cases, exceedingly good. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, absolutely. Um... Yeah, so that's that's Ash and Cook. Uh, I'll do a one star. Yeah, go for in it. In response to that, this one's pretty long, and I've never read it, so it's, we'll it's see. It's not by Chase Calloway, is it? No, it's by Kyle Van Steelden. Then go right ahead, my friend. One out of five. The original 1961 animated classic has been one of my favorite childhood movies growing up. The animated film spreads awareness to animal lovers about animal cruelty and has an unforgettable wicked witch of a woman named Cruella de Vil. After the first origin story involving Maleficent, Craig Gillespie, director, and his crew decided to make another sympathetic origin story about a misunderstood antagonist. But unlike Maleficent, Cruella is a lot less enjoyable and a lot more disenchanting in quite an aggressive manner. There is almost nothing special about the craftsmanship that the filmmakers constructed. There's nothing here that is sharply executed to make this film eye-popping and fun. But I did chuckle at the men that yelped. Well, I, I guess that really did it for them. Yeah. Anyway, but nothing about the comedy is actually funny. There is hardly any surprise in this entire film. Craig Gillespie must have struggled to find a way to surprise me with shocking results. The muddled and redundant ladder might be the worst way to end a movie I have ever seen. It involves the death of a primary character, and the filmmakers decided to stretch out the film more with just walking in slow motion. The <laughs> suspenseful score at the second half was decent, but not only that is but not only is it forgettable, but also when it comes to the somber elements of the score, it does not succeed to make me feel bad for anyone in this movie. My big issue with the music is the overstuffed soundtrack with an absurd amount of 70s punk rock songs and other colorful songs that did not support the movie's narrative nor the emotional level at all. Here is another calamity. Also, unlike Maleficent, the origin story of the titular character is unsympathetic. Sure, she does have an understandable backstory, but I can't help denying the sympathy for her as I have noticed that the story is poorly executed. Let me explain. The main antagonist named Baroness by Emma Thompson does have some goals. The questions are, how and why did the Baroness become evil? And how did her Dalmatian dogs end up being aggressive guard dogs? Did she mistreat them? Did she train them to be vicious? These questions remain unanswered. At least Cruella was nice to her own dog, and her sidekicks are nice to their dog, but when Cruella said, I'm going to kill your dogs, I was offended. (laughs) The big drawback is that Dalmatians are truly not aggressive. They're mostly energetic and sensitive dogs, and if unhappy or meeting strangers, they become high-strung. There are some lines of dialogue that actually force us to be on the evil side of individuals, which is unnecessary. As for the acting performances, the men were exaggerating their portrayals of British men with twitching and barking, while the women are obviously classy, and that's pretty much it. In conclusion, the origin story of Cruella de Vil is reckless, dull, and unsympathetic. Not to mention that it makes us not want to root for the lovable canines anymore, aspires cruelty, and aspires compassion for the dark side entirely. Not recommended to anyone. 
Yeah, I don't know that his complaints are the same complaints I have. Yeah. But um, uh, yeah, yeah, he was really turned off by the depiction of the dogs. Yeah, yeah. Some notes on Dalmatians. I mean, God bless him for it. That's good. Yeah. Evidently, an animal lover, I suppose, which is nice. But um, I I had a thought on that, but I lost it. That that. I yeah. think I think there is something to be said that Cruella's behavior is just terrible. And the movie seems insistent on being like, but it's cool though, right? <laughs> it's cool though. Like we're cool though, and it's just like, no, dude. Like no, th- we're not. None of this is cool. Yeah, no, that's fucked up, actually. <laughs> yeah, right. Um. All right. With that, I guess uh, we'll read this uh, last one star review, and then we'll uh, we'll give our ratings. Right. Oh. Uh, so this is by uh, Chase Calloway, and it is a one star review, and it reads. Her black and white hair isn't her fault. She's just an innocent victim. This is yet another, quote-unquote, woke oh, movie get em. Re- remake oh. that forces the viewer to feel sympathy towards evil. Evil! In this episode, Cruella, the devil, is a young girl who isn't accepted because of her love for fashion as a little girl <laughs> and how she must also hide her birth defect from the world. Her black and white hair. Cue teardrop. So, to disrespect the story from the get-go, the reason for Corella's disdain for Dalmatians comes from a random act of aggression towards her from these three, Dal- uh, these three show Dalmatians at a Victorian-style runway show as a girl. <laughs> the aggressive, in quotations, probably male to push the anti-masculinity Jesus agenda. Christ. Dalmatian Come chases on. poor, defenseless, and innocent Cruella around the runway. Uh, hang on, there's more. i got to find it. Probably male Dalmatians <laughs> to push the anti-masculine agenda. Only to follow her outside and immediately focus on Cruella's mother, standing next to a cliff, pushing her over into rolling tides, crashing into the side of the rock face. Don't worry, none of the CGI dogs were harmed during this scene. Oh my Christ. I stopped watching after that. It was plain as day to see the rest of the movie was, or how the rest of the movie was going to go. Sympathy towards the devil for her unfortunate life and how mean the world is, uh, is around her until she can't take being pushed down anymore and fights back against the overpowered, unknown female antagonist. I wouldn't be surprised if Corella is some kind of superpower at this point, and no one knew about it, like she can summon her coats back to life to attack her enemies. <laughs> Movie idea. I would love that. Anyway, <laughs> it's the same thing we're seeing these days with movies, specifically Disney movies. A poor attempt at reinventing the, the wheel to fish your money and time. It isn't worth either. They want you to look at bad and evil people as victims and that should be comforted and accepted, inevitably causing confusion to your children. Don't watch it. It's not worth it. We can end this game by not playing along. 36 people found this helpful. Yeah, well, fuck them. Uh, that's the thing. I don't like the one-star reviews because a lot of them are just like that. And it's just like, I'm sorry, probably male dog. Yeah. What the fuck is that? I just I, I think one of the funniest things about this uh, this review to me is that they like watched like the first like five minutes yeah, right, right, and right. were like this is I'm dumb. done <laughs> and then wrote this like three four or four paragraph review dumb mm. yep yeah no that that's uh, I didn't like the movie but that's not a smart person right there <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Uh, well are you ready to, to to rate this movie Mike yes. Um, let's see. Uh, I think to some extent, um, there would be multiple, uh, ratings I could give this movie because of, uh, it, the, the sentimentality that this movie has for, for being the basis of this podcast. Uh, but I'm going to push that aside, uh, because at the end of the day, aside from whatever great time I had watching this movie with you the first time and whatever, kind of boring time we had watching it the second time uh i think the movie itself has to has to be what's judged here not the experience yes and with that uh this very clearly gets a (coughs) out of (coughs) 
and honestly, I think that's kind of generous. I might agree with that. The idea that it's generous. Uh, I think it's interesting to assert that we rate based off the movie and not our experience when I've rated purely based off experience many times. No, that's true. And I think I'm going to do it again today. So with that in mind, I'm going to give this one a... Who let the dogs out? Out of... Now I want to be your dog. Because that's what I'm feeling right now. And there you have it, folks. That's one year... Of what the hell was that? Uh, like, at this rate, I think we have, like, just shy of 30 episodes. Hooray! 30 damn movies that we've watched. God, has it really been that many? I, a little bit less, but by the time this comes out, it might be 30. It does it, wow. Yeah, um, this is cool. Thank you to everybody who's listened to us so far. Uh, I, I am always astounded to see the actual number of uh, plays that our podcasts do have. Uh, considering that we have done absolutely no promotion. Not a damn thing. Uh, so thank you for listening. Share with a friend if you feel so inclined. Yeah. And uh, please uh, leave your um, suggestions for movies that we should watch. Um, and, yeah, again, thank you for all the love over the year. It's, uh, it's been great. Over the year? Over the year. Yeah, <laughs> as, as soon as I said it, I was like, I probably could have <laughs> chosen my words better. But, uh, yeah, over the year. It's yeah. been nice. Yeah. Well, with that, uh, thank you very much, and have a good dang night. Dude.